Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Bama Standard. We are brought to you by Workspace Solutions and Michael Petyak of Oakmont Financial Partners, LLC. I'm your host, Justin Riley, and with me as always is a former All-SEC linebacker and Brian Denny, living legend, Marvin Constant. Hey, What's hey, going hey. on? <laughs> Stephen is... Sorry, go ahead, brother. Oh, I say just another day, living the dream. Yeah. We definitely have a good show tonight. Uh, unfortunately, guys, Stephen M. Smith will not be with us tonight. He received some bad news about a friend and had to take care of that. So, unfortunately, he's gone, but he'll be back next week. Well, while we wait for our esteemed guest, let's go ahead and jump into Constant Chaos. Martin, what do you got for us this week? It's going to be very interesting. <laughs> I have no very doubt. Very interesting. I was very, I was surprised, but at the same time, a little bit shocked. Not really mm. shocked, but wondering how this dynamic is going to work. So Nick brings in Todd Grantham. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Amidst all of our defensive woes, you bring him in as an analyst. I think he needs a little bit more responsibility than an analyst. Maybe you should have made him someone's big brother. <laughs> and who would that someone be? Or, or a number of other titles. But either way, I'm very interested to see what dynamic he brings to the defense. I mean, because they have a lot of pieces returning on that defense. That defense should be stellar next year. So I, I, I think that, you know, Pete can take all the help he can get. So I'm hoping this is a good thing and the partnership goes well. But it's very, very interesting that they hire him. Now, let's see how this goes. Well, this is the Nick Saban home of wayward coaches, and nobody rehabilitates coaches better than the Nick Saban. But, yeah, how would this dynamic fit? Uh, he's coming in with mixed reviews. As a matter of fact, he actually had the nickname Third and Grantham, kind of similar to another coach we might know. Uh, he had yeah. a great a great year uh, coaching Mississippi State a few years back. Because, uh, of course, he had those hosses in his lineup. So how, how do you see this dynamic playing out? Is he a guy that Nick Saban can kind of wave his magic wand and quote, unquote, rehabilitate? Or is it? I think he has enough of a defensive mind that, you know, given the right talent, the right pieces, he can actually do some great work, you know. So it'll be interesting to see how – that relationship works as far as him, um, the rest of the defensive coaches, and Coach Saban. But at the end of the day, it should be a good thing. You know, you can never have too many great defensive minds on one staff. So hopefully, you know, they can put all the pieces together, and it turns out to be a marriage made in heaven. But we shall see. <laughs> hopefully it's a, a great marriage of great relationships where he's able to identify with the players and be able to communicate well with them and, and most importantly, develop these guys, have them in the right spots, have the, have the, the boneheaded decisions gone and forgotten that we're so accustomed to. Yeah. That's, that's the biggest thing I'm looking for. Yeah, this is going to be the first draft in a long time that Alabama won't have a defensive player going in the first round. It's hard to, to imagine that, given some of the talent that we have. I, I kind of thought Christian Harris may sneak into the first round, but now they're saying maybe second at the earliest, third, possibly fourth. I mean, the, you have to have the production. You know, the production has to be there. And unfortunately, we just – we haven't had that production this year to where we had that guy that says, okay, this is our guy. This is our dog. This is our – Number one, this is our Reuben Foster. This is our our uh, um, Matt Wilson. This is our you know C.J. Mosley. You know, this is our Dante Hightower. We just we didn't have that. You know, we didn't have an Ashawn Robinson this year. You know, we didn't have a Quentin Williams. We we didn't have any of that. You know, and you know secondary, we didn't have a Patrick Sertan. We didn't have a Drake or Patrick. You know, we, I mean, let's just call it what it is. So. I also felt like there wasn't an, any continuity amongst the defensive players, especially in the secondary. Right. You you were swapping players in and out each week, and there just really was nothing stable. You had right. a lot of individuals who did great things or good things on occasion, but as a whole, it just wasn't working. And that, that's something we're not typically uh, we typically see. Yeah. 
So, yeah, so it'll be very interesting to see with a lot of those guys coming back next year, how they gel and bond in the off season, you know, through through training and other things to, you know, get that defense back on track and back to where it should be. Without a doubt. Now, do you feel like that there is an alpha coming up based on what you saw last year? Will Anderson, you know, of course, he, he is that guy. But yeah, is Dallas, I mean, Dallas Turner going to be that no no, brainer. dude? Yeah. You know, I think Will Anderson and Dallas Clark will definitely be two guys that make a name for themselves or continue to make names for themselves. They'll put a lot of money in their pockets, you know. I think those two guys are going to continue to separate themselves from everybody else. And, you know, I just look forward to seeing it. So. Yeah, me too. And as far as up front, you mentioned we didn't have that big guy uh, at, at nose or on the defensive front that just wrecked uh, people's lives. I feel like Byron Young may be that guy. He started to show flashes, you know, Tennessee game and on, and now he's on the spotlight in the forefront to kind of take over in that role. But I also feel like Tim Smith can be that guy if DJ Dell can't live up to the height that he received when he first got there uh, or, or possible um, – I, I, I forgot the other guy's name. Uh, Burroughs, Jamil Burroughs. He's another guy right. that showed flashes. But those are guys I'm looking at that could possibly return us back to having that that great wall of hell gnaw. Like when you mentioned that Sean Robinson was there. Yeah, we definitely got to get back to being more fundamentally sound and more solid up front. That front seven is going to dictate how many games you actually win. Secondary is important, but the front seven plays more of a role in the actual play of of the that that secondary you know because if a quarterback has all day to throw you know even if you got Deion Sanders back there he can't cover all day so right. you know you have to have a solid front seven to keep things in check so I'm definitely looking forward to us getting back to that point where we have that solid front seven that controls the tempo of the game as well as keeps offenses on the sideline so do you uh, give Pete Golding a pass from this last year or is this the year where you say put up or shut up? Because on paper, uh, realistically, year, we should have a top three defense. This was year three. There's no passes in year three. If he were a head coach, he'd have been fired in year three for his performance. Yeah, I agree. Before Jeremiah comes on, I just <clears throat> turn it over to the offensive side of the Bill O'Brien is coming back. I don't know if that was a decision he made or if we're stuck with him. Do you think a lot of his ineptitude was a result of poor offensive line play and possibly being handcuffed because of limited play calling? Well, I mean, here's the thing about it. As an offensive coordinator, you have to create opportunities. When you fit, when you see you're missing certain pieces, if I know my line is struggling to block, I'm going to go to more of a screen game to make those defenders on that defensive line slow down. I'm going to run more draws, more things that's going to throw them off balance. You understand? So as a play caller, it's your job to call the best plays possible given your person L. Yeah, I, I agree with that. But one of the key things I looked at was third and short or fourth and short. We weren't able to move the ball. The offensive line got nothing. We gave up, what, 39 sacks that, this year? That's not heard of for Alabama. And a lot of people got mad at the fact that Bill O'Brien down in the red zone – was, was dialing up pass plays. And I'm kind of on, on the fence when it comes to, you know, if the offensive line can't block, what, what can you essentially do? And I hate it for B-Rob because B-Rob was primed for a, fun, a fantastic season. Yes, he had over 1,000 yards rushing. But I felt like had the offensive line had the right piece, he could have had a nausea-like performance. Right. You know, you definitely, as a running back, need an offensive line that blocks for you. So, you know, at the end of the day, we all know that there were offensive line struggles this past year. But, again, you know, your team works all offseason to prepare just like everyone else's. So, clearly somebody dropped the ball somewhere. So, I'm not going to point the, uh, the finger at the uh, players. I'm going to say who made the bad decisions to put them in that position. Absolutely. Uh, in other news, we got the official um, nod from Dr. Ray that he is leaving to go to the New Orleans Saints. What kind of impact do you think this is going to have in the strength and conditioning program? I mean, it's always going to have an impact when you're changing strength and conditioning coaches, you know, because, again, you don't know what the previous guy's philosophy was, you know, how he was training those players. So the new guy has to come in and assess where all the players are and then make the determinations for what they need based upon their positions, their deficits, you know. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a funny business being a strength and conditioning coach because, again, you have to know so much personally about each individual player. I mean, all the way down to eating habits, you know, when yeah. they sleep. Because all of that directly affects how they train. 
So yeah, oh, God, I would hate to have that job. <laughs> One of the the biggest things that I saw that he brought to the table was the, the injuries, with the exception of this year, disappeared. We I mean, were suffering injury upon injury uh, year after year, the later part of Scott Cochran's tenure. But as soon as Dr. Matt Ray came in, those were virtually non-existent. Look at last I year. Mean, but he's only, he was only there for, what, two years? Yeah, but that's a dramatic turnaround, though, so from you're saying averaging four or five players getting hurt. One year, no injuries. This year, that was a crap load of them. So I'm going to say that's a mixed bag, Justin. I can't give him credit for that. <laughs> I'm just trying to be positive. Uh, let's see, Sean Huntsville, when you, you, you're very vanilla and past concepts, the defense will simply uh, pattern mu- match you to death. UGA did this in a national title game. Exactly. That's why you have to mix it up when screen game. Uh, you need some deep drags. Uh, you need some play action passes. You need a variety of things. When you come out with the same game plan every week, uh, yeah, they're going to figure out what you're doing. That offense never really mixed in a lot of the offensive concepts that you need to be successful. You look at how Sarkeesian calls plays. You look mm-hmm. at how Lane yeah. Kiffin calls plays. You look at how Hugh Freeze calls plays. You don't know what you're going to get on which down. First down, is a, it's a toss-up. Second down, is, you never know what you're going to get. You have to keep a defense off balance, especially if you're playing against a defense that has a lot of athletes. We didn't do that. Yeah, I, I agree. Let's see. Oh, and so does Sean. He agrees with your assessment as well. <laughs> but, um, yeah, looking forward to A-Day, seeing what we're, what these, these young guys are going to put out there, especially in the offensive line and at wide receiver. Um, do you have any insight as to who you feel is going to be that new guy uh, on that wide receiver core that's going to get us back to speed, speed, speed? Judging by the last performance, uh, I'm not going to pick either. <laughs> I'll let you think they, on that. They, you know, they, they, they had an opportunity, and if you go back to 2017 when those young guys had an opportunity, Ruggs, Judy, uh, all those guys, they took advantage of it. You know, They took advantage of their opportunities. Devontae Smith took advantage of opportunities. Same thing, fast forward another year, another championship game, and they didn't take advantage of it. Right. You know, they didn't take advantage of it. So, you know, can you really say one play in particular? I mean, you go back to 2017, you know, uh, Devontae Smith catches touchdown in overtime to beat Georgia 23-26. You know, we had plays, players that could have made similar plays this year, and we didn't do it. So when you don't make plays when the play was called, it's hard for someone to say, I can count on you. And right now, I can't say, I can count on you. And I think that's a big reason why we didn't see them in the whole year. You mentioned Ruggs and Judy and, and their crew. They had the mentality of stay ready, next man up. Be prepared for when that, that moment comes. These, uh, these guys, as talented as they may be, were more concerned about being seen on Twitter and social media and complaining and not really preparing. And there wasn't a whole lot of trust, like you said, in these guys. And then when it was their time to – to be on the big stage, they didn't necessarily uh, live up to the hype. What do you mean didn't necessarily? They didn't. There's no didn't necessarily. They didn't. <laughs> I'm sure we can continue to talk about I just heard a really nice sound. That means somebody is in our waiting room. Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you a living legend, an all-American, an icon, a man that's responsible for some of the biggest hits and greatest interceptions. Matter of fact, he's the founder of DBU, Jeremiah Castile. Welcome in, brother. Thank you. I, I, I love that introduction, Justin. I love it. <laughs> I taught him everything he know. Hey, Marvin, how you doing? <laughs> I'm doing well. How are you? How's the family? Hey, everybody's well. We're doing well. Yeah, <laughs> Uh, Jeremiah, he told he told uh, EJ Jr. last week that he taught him everything he knew as well. So, I guess everybody that comes on, he was the protagonist for everybody's career. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, EJ this, actually taught me. So <laughs> that's a great he teacher. Probably reminded me, you probably were nowhere even born by the time you, you right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Well, before we kind of jump into it, how have you been? What's going on, man? What's going on with your foundation? Get us a little, get us updated uh, with what's going on in your world. Well, I have 
entering my 21st year as chaplain for the University of Alabama football program. And uh, that is, um, we have a football, <clears throat> I'm football chaplain, so if there's a title I go by, that would be it. So for the last 20 seasons, I have uh, had the opportunity to work uh, down on campus with our with our former players. And it has just been a joy for me and for uh, Coach Saban to trust me with what we do with our players. And uh, when that opportunity came 20 years ago, I, I was really honored to be able to do that. And uh, one of the things we do is we do leadership development with our players and uh, and so in the summers, we didn't with the last couple of COVID seasons, uh, summers, but we actually have though we do camps and we have those guys go out and work our camps and teach middle schoolers and high schoolers. They coach them during our, our camps in the summer. We call them character camps. Mm. So that's what they're called. And we really stress um, for them to, to develop their character at a, at a young age. Man, that's awesome. That's a tremendous blessing. Um, and you said 20 years. That's really all that time passed. I don't think you've aged, to be honest with you. Why weren't you there about 22 or 23 years ago? Because <laughs> <laughs> then maybe you could have prayed over Dr. Fowler's hands and he could have actually done the job he was supposed to do. Well, it was all Marvin is actually was all in God's time. And I was coaching yeah. high school in Birmingham helping Tim and Simeon them win state championships at Broadwood Christian High School. So <laughs> Yeah, Tim told me y'all was working out not too long ago and I said, Oh, so you got some sixty two year old knees. I said, Oh, we done figured out the problem now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh I got a bone to pick with you on that Marvin because Oh, we like uh, this part. Go uh, right ahead. Yeah, I, I was I was in the I was watching the uh and Tim didn't even stand up for his pops. I'm like Tim, <laughs> Man, I was talking about you. I was talking about Tim with them bad knees. <laughs> yeah, but when you said that age, I thought you was talking about me. No, That's no. About Tim. And uh, I said, I was sitting there thinking, Tim, you got to show him some about my Instagram workouts if you think I got sixty-two year old knees. They ain't nothing sixty-two that about you. That was about Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Every time we talk, we always give each other a little bit of grief about our bad knees. And I told him, I got a new knee now. I'm out the club. Out the club. <laughs> it's in the transfer portal. <laughs> <laughs> Matter of fact, the main person who was causing the most uh, havoc was Steve Brown. And you noticed he what he's not here yet. <laughs> yeah, he, he was. He's giving, uh, the, giving Tim the hardest time about all that. Yes, he sure was. <laughs> My my knee is, is nine weeks old, so we doing good, you know. We we Man, got a new boy, bro. And <laughs> <laughs> hey, we still training him, still teaching him how to walk and do everything. We getting that yes, over. Yes. <laughs> well, let's go ahead and jump into it. Uh Jeremiah. Well, I got a quick question oh, go right ahead. You, though. How's your wife doing? I know she Excellent. Excellent. Man, I'm married. I, as they say, I outkick my coverage. <laughs> <laughs> I'm married up, bro. I tell you what. Matter of fact, when I go and speak and I'm speaking in places, I'm talking to men. I I tell them I said I have six children. My wife has seven. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all get that before I go. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. I, I say, and it, it, I say, all you men out there now, you need to say amen on that one because I said amen. You you got a good family, bro. You know your wife helped raise you. <laughs> right. Hey, man, stay, you stay looking at me. Do you really need to be doing that? <laughs> what do you mean? There's nothing wrong with this. <laughs> it's always something. <laughs> it's most it's very entertaining. But uh, yeah. what I was going to say is, Jeremiah, can you talk about your life growing up in Phoenix City and what it meant for you when God opened the door for you to come to Alabama? Woo, man, that's a, you know, I, I feel like I'm one of the most blessed uh, people in the world just based on the, what I was born, born into, uh, just the, the situation in my home with both my parents. Both my parents had about a fourth grade education and I'm number eight of nine and uh, <clears throat> 
<laughs> domestic violence, alcohol, drugs was in in that environment. That's what I was born into as the eighth of nine children. And none of my siblings had gr had graduated from high school. My dad just was well, fourth grade, grade education just was, you know, he, he very limited in what he could do growing, you know, as a, uh, he was a World War II vet. And um, I, I, I think my father suffered with PTSD back then and they didn't, we didn't know how to diagnose it, but uh, it was just a very volatile household, very volatile. And um, the Lord just uh, at 13, I, um, all I can say is he intervened, really. Um, and uh, I came to the Lord at 13, a little church. You could you could take a rock and throw it and hit the church where about three doors from my house. And that was really the turning point in my life. And during that, from 13 on and very early on, what God was able to uh, really just download it in, um, <clears throat> in my life was, hey, this situation is an opportunity for you to change. I want, I want you to change this, this situation with your mom and your dad. With my mom really having an alcoholic, alcoholic problem that was out of control, that's what God put in my heart that, hey, you, you can help change this. And, and what the game plan was, I want was that, hey, you can go to college on an athletic scholarship, football, and uh, get, get a degree, get a good job, come back and change the circumstances in your home. So that's what I got busy with as a 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 year old. And then when the university came knocking with, what I call the opportunity of a lifetime and saying, we want to give you a scholarship. I can still remember where I was at when I got my letter that they wanted to give me. A, I was in the, in the, in the cafeteria at Central high school in Phoenix city. And that's, I hung out in there all the time because I was trying to find a meal or two to eat. <laughs> trying the second best eating. central in Alabama. Central of Phoenix city. Yeah. Central Tuscaloosa. Yeah. And, uh, I got that letter. I opened it. Coach Wayne Trayward gave me that letter. I opened it. Man, I was just, yeah, man. I ran out of the lunchroom yelling all across the campus. Roll tide. I'm going to Alabama. Soon as and, you opened it, you knew. Yes. And uh, so I came over and visited. Um, Alabama was playing, I think, uh, Ole Miss, Mississippi State at that time. And man, I'm sitting there watching games and yeah, that looking at the left cornerback position, that's what I was in high school. Say, man, that's going to be my spot. Don McNeil was actually a starter at that time at that position. And I'm like, man, that's my spot. That's my spot right there, baby. That's going to be my spot. In uh, 1979, I was a freshman, ended up playing on the 79 national championship team as a freshman and then started in 1980 as a sophomore at, junior and senior you know one of the things I, i've always talked about and people say i'm too critical when i talk about coaches and how they impact players especially on the college level because here's the thing you can attest to this i'm pretty sure like a lot of other people most people who play football aren't playing for fun they're playing to change their circumstances like you said they come from different households like my dad dropped out in the eighth grade my mom didn't go to college so i knew Hey, this was my opportunity to get in a better situation than I was raised in. So a lot of people don't understand just how much of an impact sports and the game of football has on these people's lives. And they take it for granted. They don't think that these coaches play that much of a role in terms of their development and how they're going to end up. You know, yeah, you got the head coach, but the position coaches play more of a role in the growth and the development of those players than the head coach do. Well, Mari, my, my freshman year, Coach Bill Oliver was my position coach. And all I can tell you, man, he broke me in. <laughs> you know, the, the man as a two of days back in, hey, but he made, he, his way of coaching and the way he coached me, I played as a freshman, but every, you know what? I earned every bit of it. He didn't give me anything. And man, and when I tell you he was tough, 
But what happened was I became tough. I took on his personality. And I look back at, you know, oh, now when I, you know, all the years back, I'm like, you know, I was 5'9", 155, 60 pounds, and I could dominate my position. I mean, it, and I look back, and it was the what you're saying, Coach Bill Oliver, and after that, uh, Coach uh, Lewis Campbell. Man, both of those guys made me the player that I became along with Coach Bryant, but the everyday work was those coaches. And, I mean, I tell you, they were tough, and they made me tough. And the results were, uh, you know, four years of playing that I was an All-America. All right. So you played back late 70s, early 80s. You went on to play in the NFL. Playing defensive back during that area, era, it, you know, it wasn't uh, much passing as it is today. So what would Mr. Jeremiah Castillo look like playing in today's NFL and college football with all this passing? Well, you can't run up in that box and lay that wood like you want to. <laughs> well, if you check the records, I, I, my senior year, I tied the record in interceptions at Alabama. And, act, and, and uh, I kind of talk about this a little bit. And back then, they didn't count your bold, bold interceptions. So they don't count my bowl interception, which I had five bowl interceptions on top of the 16 regular season. So that's a total of 21 interceptions. So if you take 21 interceptions in a four-year college career, that's that averages out to five interceptions per season. And um, I was taught to dominate my position. I don't, you know, people today, I, I don't believe the receivers are faster. Uh, you can say they. I don't believe there are any. I, I can name some guys that were world class sprinters that I played against. And those were my best games, uh, number wise. Willie Gault was a, a 1984 Olympic high hurdler uh, for the University of Tennessee. I got my best numbers, th three interceptions in that game. Mike Miller, Anthony Hancock, all those guys were SEC sprinters, and. Uh, it was what I was taught, how to play the game, what was expected of me, what was expected of me. And that is vital to really, uh, when I think back to what, you know, how I look at today, man, I'm thinking, well, what I was taught back then, <laughs> oh my goodness, I leave up out there with four or five interceptions a game. <laughs> and, you uh, know, it seems like a lot of these guys, they don't have those expectations anymore. You know, I think we were coached a lot differently than they are now. Well, not even so much as coach, but a different mindset. You know, nobody, it seems like a lot of these guys don't want to be held accountable today. You know, they're all, you know, they're all Instagram famous. They're all Twitter famous. So they think they can do whatever they want to do. So having your boys as great as they are and being raised the way you were raised and the coaches you had, what are the lessons that you taught Tim, uh, uh, Caleb, and Simeon that made them into the great athletes and men that they are? Well, the first lesson that I believe you teach any athlete that has potential is preparation. Teaching them to learn how to prepare. Winning in championships and execution at the highest level starts with preparation. So what is the workload that you're going to demand of the of your of the players and and so <laughs> that's what i was taught i was taught how to prepare and the workload was um man i mean when you lined up put when you lined up on saturdays you enjoyed the game you had fun playing the game fun to me that you have to in, in to me, the great coaches, even today, the game has to stay fun. Man, when we line up on Saturday, man, I'm like, whoo, baby, turn me loose, coach. It's been it's been rough all week, man. Y'all done had your boy off of, you know, behind the gate. Now you let me open the gate. Really, that was, and we had fun doing it because of just how rigorous the training, I mean, what the practices. So when you got out there on Saturday, what you were saying, man, ain't the shoot. it's time to have fun now. Yeah, very true. But, you you know, when you're having that fun, a lot of times you're caught in the heat of the moment. You know, you let your emotions 
sometimes get the best of you. You know, we're playing Ole Miss in Ole Miss in 99, and they throw a little screen pass, and the guy, he gets about 15, 20 yards, you know, gain on the play. And I've ran all the way across the field. I'm like, I've ran about 30 yards to get here. I'm hitting somebody. And I get a personal foul for unnecessary roughness. Ellis Johnson looked at me like he wanted to do something to me like real bad. So what was your heat of the moment mistake that you might have made? Because everybody has something that they've done. And they'd be like, man, why did I do that? Well, see, you. I'm just thinking about what you just said. We used to, we had a, we had this little code in practice. You know, hey man, that guy on the other side of the field, he was gonna hold him up for you when you was running up 30 yards. <laughs> hey, hold him up, bro. Don't put him down. <laughs> yes. Yeah, hey, because I'm coming 30 yards. I I can feel you. But to be honest with you, Marvin, I coach Bryant, the way we practiced and uh what was demanded of you I, literally you bro you 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 weren't going you was afraid to even get a personal foul coach i'm being honest with you bro <laughs> Man, bro I, that was that I, I it never happened to me i'm just being I, I was just that afraid of coach bryant and just the man his what he demanded of us and the excellence uh on the field play and uh not doing bonehead stuff, man. I anyway, um, I took that to 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 the highest level, and I, so I just had this real reverence. And I, when I say fear, I'm you know what I'm. I'm just man, it, right? I just had a tremendous respect for the way Coach Bryant wanted the game to be played, and you didn't want that, to disappoint him. That that's correct. And I was just mad because I done ran all the way over here. I'm like, look, somebody getting hit. Yeah. So, but, you, you know, everybody always speaks of Coach Bryant in such a hot light. Everyone who I talked to, every interview, or just had a casual conversation, we always said that he respected his players. He treated them like men. He made sure that he treated you to the best of his ability and that when you walked out of his program, you were the best man that you could be. And a lot of players always say that's the kind of coach that I want to play for. A coach who's going to respect me. He's not going to talk. He's not going to dog talk me. He's not going to do stuff uh -huh. to me and run Amen. me in the dirt. Amen. So that's why I think so many people respect him and hold him in their light is from the way he treated his players. And, you know, honestly, I think a lot of times I would love to have played for him, you know, just. You would have loved talk him. About it. You, if Mar Marvin, if you were a hard worker, if you, you didn't want somebody to give you something and you want, you were just looking for opportunity and you was going to put the grind in, you would have loved Coach Bryant. Because my, for instance, my first, I'm a, I'm a freshman in 1979. It's two a days in August real tour days back then you know <laughs> anyway so uh you got you got you you got a month whole month of tour days in back then and we got about two weeks in so i'm coming in from practice and i got this pink sticky note on my locker and it said coach bryant want to see you <laughs> i'm sitting there like well, man i don't want to see him i'm scared i'm like man what have i done now, if you remember, that 79 team went on to win the national championship. It was the – and we had won it in 78. So they, those guys were returning national champions. And that team was loaded. Here I am, a freshman. And um, so I get this note. I go up to third floor of Coleman Coliseum. Secretary said, have a seat. He'll be with you in a minute. Long minute, man. I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, my goodness. Anyway, door opens up. She say, yeah, you can go on in. I go in. Coach Bryant's sitting there at his desk. And I can remember this like it was yesterday. He's smoking one of them Chesterfields. And, you know, he had that old Southern drawl. When he talked, you had to listen very closely. He murmured some words, sit on the couch. He had that black and white checkered couch. There weren't no legs on that couch. So when you sat out, your bottom hit the floor. You was looking up at it. And he, this is what he said. He says, Jeremiah, you can play here at the University of Alabama. And when he said it, I'm, I, my, you know, I'm thinking, yeah, yes, when my turn comes. 
I'm behind a 6'2", 200-pound NFL prototype named Don McNeil. <laughs> you know, he got to get out of there first. And this was his next words. He said, you can play this year. I, I, and I tell people, I went in there 5'9", I came out 6'9". <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I'm walking out of the door. Coach Bryant took about 10 minutes with me. I'm heading out the door, and this is what he says. He says, you see the door right there? He said, that door is always open. If you ever have a problem, don't you hesitate to come knock on that door. And so his ability to connect heart to heart with his players, I just haven't met any. I, he, he, he had a wisdom about him when it came to people. His ability to connect with people was tremendous and his play and he connected with his players and uh, that's what he did with me and I left out of there you know saying coach Bryant cares about me not as a player but as a person and from there on man you it's just he asked you to jump it's how high coach it's how high and that's the that's the wisdom that he he, uh, I think he led his players with that type of wisdom. When you play for a coach like that, it, it molds you and it shapes you into the man that you are, the great individual that you are. So what was your inspiration for putting on your event in December? What was your inspiration for and what was the end goal for? And I hate I missed it. If I wasn't down and out, I would have been there. But what was it that made you say, okay, I want to do this event? What was your vision? And and if you're around me seven days in a week, I'm talking about Coach Bryant, five of them, <laughs> at least. Because my philosophy on life, I got a lot of my philosophy on life I got from Coach Bryant. I was one of those players. I'm sitting on the front row when Coach Bryant come in the meeting room, man. I'm taking notes on everything he's saying because I'm trying to do something with my life. I got people back home depending. I got a mother, alcoholic mother depending on me to make something out of my life. So, man, my four years, hey, bro, I don't have time to be lollygagging around. I don't have I, – I, and so Coach, Coach Bryant, his philosophy, I listen to every word. So to this very day, uh, his impact on my life and um, – so when the opportunity for uh, when I started just researching and finding that the, the 2021 season would have been the, was the 50th year for integrated football at Alabama. Uh, 1971 was the first year that black players uh, play at the University of Alabama. And those two players were was John Mitchell and Wilbur Jackson. The indebtedness in my heart. For Coach Bryant the University of Alabama. I'm eternally indebted. Now, some players don't feel that way. Okay, I do. Because my, his philosophy and the, the opportunity, I don't go to the NFL. I don't get that chance. I don't get drafted in the third round without the opportunity the university gave me as a student athlete. We start right there, student athlete. And so what I wanted to do, Marvin, I wanted to say thank you back to the University of Alabama and to the Bryant family and to the, the honorees that had paved the way. Those black players that came and they opened the door, they took on things that by the time I've gotten there, what, eight years later, things were smoother. Things were better. And then subsequently all of, you know, by the time you get there. And so how do we not say thank you to the University of Alabama. How do we not say thank you to the Bryant family? How do we not say thank you to those honorees? And and you look at the national championships that have come out of. I played on Coach Bryant last national championship, which was 1979. So in the decade of the 70s, when he was integrating, he won three national championships with integrated teams. 
and was the first coach to win 100 games in a decade. And that decade was the 1970s when he integrated. So, brother, I'm just – I'm my words, Marvin, is I'm eternally indebted to the University of Alabama, the Bryant family, and those honorees. And so I couldn't sit by on my watch knowing 50 years was going to come up on this and uh, not do anything. Well, I will say this. I seen the pictures, and it was beyond amazing. Beautiful. Everybody who I talked to said that they had a great time. <laughs> And I was so miserable that I couldn't walk to be there, <laughs> you know, because it was a few days before my knee replacement. But literally every picture I seen, I was nothing but smiles. People dressed to the T. I mean, it looked like it was one amazing event. And no words I have can really express what I'm about to say, but I'm going to try to say it the best I can. That was beyond big of you to do that event. Because there's not a lot of people who would have stepped up to the plate to even take on the task. There's not a lot of people who would even celebrate the fact that these players were the first ones to come on board to integrate this team to give all of us the opportunity to play. Not a lot of people would have even championed that. So let alone to champion and to turn it into the great event that it was. I'm going to tell you, it's a lot of guys looking forward to the next one already. We're just waiting for the call or the invite like, When's the next one? <laughs> we and we we are planning it as we speak, Marvin. We are planning the next one because the decade of the '70s was a powerful time in Alabama football, and we want people to remember that. We want to continue to re, to remember that. But I was going to say, one of the things that motivate me and people have heard me tell my story. See, after I got drafted, I was able to put my mother in rehab. And she mm. came out sober and with a relationship with the Lord. And she lived that way for the next 35 years. Wow. So I'm, you, now you see why I say I'm eternally indebted. My, and my mother got a chance to come back and watch her grandsons play at the University of Alabama. And you know, spend the next 30 something. So, man, I, it's just really only God could write a script like mm -hmm. that. The script of my life, only the Lord could have written that script that uh, my mother would, would get a chance to um, to see her. Because she didn't come when I was playing. My mother was not in shape to get to my games. And uh, that was she was in a whole nother world. And when she, when the Lord sobered her up, man, she did a hundred and eight degree turn and was the best supporter of, for her grandsons that of any grandmother that could be. So that's just a, and so for me, I'm like, look at what all this opportunity gave me. And uh, the, those three entities that I've named is the reason for that. And so I had to, man, not, as I say, Marv, not on my watch, I was going to do what I needed to do to make that thing happen. Listen, you don't understand how miserable I was not being able to attend like i had made my reservation at the at the hotel i was ready not knowing that i would be coming to birmingham around that same time for a different reason though. <laughs> but you know now that I'm, I'm i'm fixed up and i'm back you know almost back to normal i will not miss the next one i don't care what's going on in the world i am going to find my way there hey well kind of what we have old. planned for the next one uh, Marvin Justin is we brought in the first five signing classes in the seventies for coach Bryant. The, the kind of the plan is we'll bring in the next five classes. That's of awesome. African -Americans. That's well, awesome. I will be there because without all of you guys doing what you did, there wouldn't have been a me and all of us, you know, right. you know, you right. know, just like I know, you know, the seventies in Alabama was a very still turbulent time, you know, yeah, times, you had all these different times. laws passed, but a lot of people weren't observing said laws still. <laughs> I got a, a question. What was it like? Speaking of that era, uh, you know, Caleb was able to uh, roll of one of those guys, Tony Nathan, who was part of that era, you know, uh, what was it like seeing him play Tony Nathan through your eyes? Well, you know, and that was like what 2014, and yeah. I, I think God used because I went down 
And I watched them shoot some of the movie in Inslee. And, you know, I watched this, like one of the scenes where Coach Bryant came to recruit Tony. Yeah. And uh, so it just, uh, to see how Coach Bryant took a personal interest in integration. Um, and, and so, you know, in 2014, 2015, whenever that was, being filmed i went over and i watched them do uh do some of the filming of it and it just it really made me realize man you know uh things were not easy it wasn't just and you know yeah. guys like tony nathan and them making the think of the the courage that's my word, right the courage that it took I said man we're gonna be the first ones and um you know when you watch the movie there's there's some they show some of the when integration was coming about some of the violence that was mm -hmm. that was some of the kickback and you start saying to yourself man for me um i i just salute it. i'm like man i got i have the utmost respect for these guys and the class that they show the character that they show how they handle themselves in the midst of that that adversity and so tony nathan was is one of those guys that, that, and so my son getting a chance to play that role, it really gave me a little bit more insight on just uh, what they had to go through personally. I got a question. Whatever my... you need me for this next time around, I'm <laughs> I do have a question from the audience. Busting tables, folding up chairs. <laughs> Call me. I got a question from the audience, and it happens to come from one of your other sons. Tim Castile wants to know why you made his sons run five miles to go get haircuts when they were five and six years old. So that's what happened to Tim Knees. He was running to get haircuts at a young age. <laughs> hey, Marvin, wait a minute. Now, don't put that on me. <laughs> Justin, you know, I... I uh, I said something earlier that philo philosophically, I'm telling you, Coach Bryant, if he said it, brother, I, 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 I took it to the bank. You know, I'm sitting there. So when, you know, when Tim and Simeon were real young and they, now they came to me and they said, Dad, we want to play football. Now, I wasn't going to force them to play, but they came to me, right. you know, and said, we want to play. So, well, you know, first thing is you got to prepare again, right, Mark? It's all about preparation. You, you yeah. guys want to play. I'm fixing to show you the price that you got to pay if you really want to play the game. So um, we had this barbershop about five or six miles from our house where they I took them to get their <laughs> haircuts. So, I, you know, man, I played for Coach Brian, bro. It, <laughs> You sit and talk to any guy play for Coach Brian, he gonna tell you, bro, it was some days you thought you was gonna die. Literally. Right. Dude, I, I I'm not I can't take another step, man. I, I believe I'm finna you know, Coach Brian, he, he knew it too, because he he been to me some men, you know. Uh you, you ain't gotta be scared of dying. Uh uh, uh you, you pass out for the die. <laughs> he tell you, hey bro, I'm gonna take you to the brink today. You gonna feel like you're gonna die. And and so um anyway so I, I just took that to say okay if my sons are gonna play this game they're gonna learn what the price is that it takes to play it so i would i told my wife i said um hey we got a little rendezvous spot about five miles down the road um <laughs> i'm gonna take them and you just meet us there okay and you pick us up and so they and, and so Coach Bryant had this saying. I mean, literally all this. Coach, Coach Bryant had this saying. He come in. He said, "Men expect the unexpected." <laughs> in in a game that, that that happens, right? Things gonna happen that you're not expecting. You how do you adjust, right? Anyway, so I I I wait till you know five thirty six o'clock in the morning. They good sleep. I go knock on their door. Dad, what you want? I said, get your running shoes on. They're like, where are we going? I said, don't worry about that. Oh, my God. So I make them put their running shoes on. 
and man we just trek we we trek out we got about a five mile route we get you know a couple of miles in and they be behind me and man i hear this <laughs> <laughs> did you have a golden retriever with you <laughs> and, uh, you know I'm I'm still in top shape back then, man. I yeah. man, you know, five miles. And I, I man, that ain't nothing for me. So I look back, they be crying. I said, man, I don't mind you crying. Just don't stop. <laughs> you cry, you want to, but not stop. You better keep picking them up, putting them down, baby. <laughs> and uh, what I would do is wait to different times. So I might wait two, three days, a week. That you know, and I go knock on the door again. Dad, what you want? Get your running shoes on, man. <laughs> I'm glad my daddy had a bad back. My God. <laughs> yeah, no, right. <laughs> and what did the barber say when y'all showed up all hot and sweaty? Yeah. <laughs> you trying to cut their hair. <laughs> uh, Tim is. Tape, if all it... <laughs> tape sweaty, got hair sticking to it. Tim, Tim was emphasizing once again. I was six years old. What Tim is trying to say is that was our torture back then. <laughs> hey. hey, what would Tim, DHR think of that today? <laughs> Tim said he was in Olympic sprinter uh, fitness in in uh, six years old. <laughs> hey. I tell you, Marvin, as a as a parent, what I my my philosophy was, I will not have lazy children. <laughs> you achieve that. You, you, one thing you know, don't know how to do is work. You know, one of the things one 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 of my friends I always say, and, and I wholeheartedly agree with this, is motivated people don't like lazy people, and lazy people don't mm. like motivated people. <laughs> and, and that is so true. And I find if I'm around somebody who late, I'm just going to walk off because I can't take it. I can't take it. <laughs> uh, Jeremiah, you talk about a lot of Coach Brian's victories, and one of those that really sticks out in the minds of Alabama fans was win number 315, and coincidentally it was against Auburn. I think that was 10 straight. Was that right? But what was the atmosphere like when y'all captured win number 315 and allowing Coach Brian to become the all-time winningest coach in football history at that point? It's one of those where you want it, again, because of your relationship. Man, I, I can tell you, brother, I truly love Coach Bryant. I love my coach, man. And I would lay it on the line. You know, a lot of times people say, man, why you hit like you hit? Why you be trying to take it? Man, I was an extension of Coach Bryant and his passion for what he did. Coach Bryant could motivate I'm t I had the mo his ability to motivate you. And so <clears throat> that game was, hey, we get a chance to be a part of history. Mm -hmm. Bro, what do we got to do to make this happen? <laughs> you know, what do <laughs> right. we got to do? And uh, it just so happened it was against Auburn. But it wouldn't have really, I, I don't, you know, and that's a rivalry, but it wouldn't have mattered who it was based on what we were trying to accomplish with Coach Bryant in that we loved him enough to say, Coach, we want this for you, and we're going to do whatever it takes. And it just so happened it was a rival game against uh, Auburn University. Right. And uh, his last game and your last game was arguably like one of your best, the Liberty Bowl, 1982. You picked off three passes, and really it seemed like it was a whole lot more than that because you were in on every play, every pass deflection. Can you take us through that last game for both you and him? That last game, uh, Justin, I tell you what, it right before captains were to go out, I got this strong prompting to get up and say something. And I hadn't done that in the four years I've been at Alabama. I don't talk. I'm, I am I just go do what I'm supposed to do, you know. Hey, coach, right. you execute. I'm not a – I wasn't a, a, a person that talked. I wasn't that type of player. I wasn't uh, verbally a, a, a verbal leader. I was just – anyway, so this strong prompt – we're sitting there, man. Captain's getting ready to go out. 
and this prompting is in my gut and it's strong i'm talking about like you gotta get up and say something and i'm fighting this thing and it's a, you don't get them say something you're gonna throw up you i'm gonna get sick that's how strong it was right. so man i just kind of nervously just raise my hand coach you know in front of coach coach can i say something and he nodded he had that big old parker coat on he nodded yeah and when i got up it just started coming out just all of how i felt i said i said coach i just want to thank you everything you did for me me coming here four years ago so coach i came here four years ago as an 18 year old boy but tonight i'm leaving as a 21 year old man mm. and i i want to thank you for that and i said coach ain't no way we're gonna lose this game tonight i said we ain't losing this game tonight i said if i gotta play this game by we ain't look man that thing just struck a fire everybody it just lit our team up and so emotionally so what you saw in that game i had been i expressed in the locker room before we came out so i was just telling i said man if it moved that night i was trying to knock it out <laughs> there was no way <laughs> you're right you'll lose that game that night and uh he meant that much to me as a as a person as a coach and someone that, that i had a relationship with and so that night i just man hey i was just feeling it man i hey and um you know i think we i caused four turnovers. We, our defense had like six turnovers in that game and i i had three interceptions and one calls fumble and wow. that, actually that last calls fumble was the the get, play that won the game because uh mike martin catches that ball he catches it and i hit him about the five yard line they, they're driving in to we were up 21 uh 15. and uh, if they score there they go on to beat us with an extra point kick speaking of fumbles i'm gonna ask this last question for all the broncos fans who might be watching you were involved in another uh fumble famous one of the top plays in nfl history uh, it was against the Browns in the AFC Championship. They were driving to possibly tie the game. And uh, this is all, this is to get to the Super Bowl. Can you talk about the fumble, one of the most recognized plays in your career, but also Broncos history? Well, man, all of that go back to how I was taught to play the game at Alabama. On defense, under Coach Donahue, it's all about turnovers. How do you create turnovers? And so I, that's why I was always thinking, if they put the ball in there, I'm going to pick it off. You just talk turnovers and uh, calls fumble. And actually, you know, I didn't start that game. I was a backup uh, to Steve Wilson. He started, that was the starting corner. But what it is, it's a God answered a prayer that I prayed mm -hmm. early in the week. I was a, I had just come to Denver. That was my first year there coming from my fifth year in the league with Tampa Bay. And I got released from Tampa Bay that that Monday on doing preseason. And Denver picked me up off a of waiver. So I got out there and I was trying to learn their system. And we, you know, we get into the playoffs and just said a prayer during the week. Hey, Lord, I sure would like to get in that game and make something happen. Well, the fourth quarter of that game, Steve Wilson caught a cramp in his calf. Couldn't go back in the game and Joe called. I'm sitting on the sideline, just you know, it's cold in January. <laughs> I'm trying to stay warm. And he says, Jeremiah, yeah, he said, you in the game. You know, like Mr. Mr. Brown, me? I'm in the game. <laughs> 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 and uh, yeah, but uh Steve can't go back in. So I go in the game. They're driving down probably five minutes to go, six, you know what six seven minutes so in there they drive down and they score a touchdown on me and webster slaughter catches a quick slant i was supposed to have help inside by the safety man you know how that go and, and you sitting there <laughs> yeah. and all your homeboys looking at you get beat on for a touchdown and i'm like man it was it was a really i had zero coverage with help inside playing hard outside it's amazing how you can still remember this stuff decades <laughs> later plays in what was called so they score bring the game within one score to tie it 
They kick the ball off to our offense. We don't do anything with it. They punt. <clears throat> we punt it back to them. And Bernie Kozar and Ernest Biner and Kevin Mack show just big boom. Boy, they start driving. They driving. You know, 20, 30, 40, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, six yard line, about a minute and 30 seconds to go. They get the ball on the six yard line. They score. They can tie the game up. We go in the overtime or whatever. And they call the same defensive play they call when I got beat. And, I, you know, my attitude, like, man, why did they call that play again? Man, <laughs> I didn't want, I was mad they called that play. I'm like, man, what they call this play for, man? That play, I got beat last time on that play. <laughs> and I'm lining up on Webster Slaughter again, the same receiver. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's uh it's zero coverage i got man you know pretty much all by myself and i go up and i'm playing man bump on the six yard line and i line up to run the play and to be honest with you justin and marvin it's like god slowed time down wow and in my thoughts i'm like Man, last time you lined up like this, you got beat for a touchdown. Mm. Don't you think you need to do something different? <laughs> yep. Right. I backed, right. I backed off of it. I backed off of him to in right in the end zone, just a hard five, six yard cushion. Anything quick, man, I can hit it, you know. And they 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 snap the ball, and Bernie gives it to Ernest Biner. So I'm, I could see the play develop early on. It's a run. Instead of, you know, if I'd have been in man bump, he would have ran me off. And so I beat uh, Webster Slaughter on his block, on the block where he was coming to block me. And Ernest and I meet on the two-yard line. We on, I'm on two-yard line. And if you ever seen Ernest Biner, you know, man, mm. that's a man right there, bro. He, 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 he was toting it, you know. And we on two-yard line. And again, it's like God slows time down. What you gonna do? I mean, all of this is boom, boom. But in my mind, I'm, it's it's it, it it still amazes me to the day. I had time to think what to do, and so Ernest had ran over everybody on our defense in that second half. He scored like three touchdowns, just boom, boom, boom. <laughs> and I'm like, man, dude, I number one, I don't want to even hit this big old fellow. <laughs> you <And>, uh, <laughs> and I'm sitting there, you know, when you do those strip drills all the time in practice and he's so close to scoring just it's almost like he's starting to release pressure off the ball my eye caught it and just boom boom I, hey man next thing man hit that ball you know so i went from well i'm gonna tackle this guy to when he just kind of was going ease up on the ball a little bit as though he was gonna raise it mm -hmm. my eye caught it and i just went boom and I fall right there on the two yard line. And with that kind of impact, you know, usually that ball to scoot through the end zone. The ball was just right there, right on just wow. to my left side. And I just rolled over on top of it. As I tell people, with about two tons of Cleveland Browns on top of it. <laughs> Man, if you could have stuck a mic up in that pile, right? <laughs> you heard the <laughs> <colorful> language. <laughs> I think oh, yeah. that you, I think you're responsible for breaking the Browns because they weren't the same since and have been for you. <laughs> well, that was how that that all of that play unfolded, and right. uh, we got a chance to go to the Super Bowl that year. So I I tell people it was a uh, a prayer answer. Yeah, that's awesome. That's powerful. Well, we're actually coming up towards the end of our show. Before we close out, Marvin, I'd like to turn it over to you. If you talk to us about 40 Plus Strong and what you got in the works for that and how people can get their hands on the book if they haven't already. Uh, you know, you can go on Amazon.com, grab your copy. You can go to 40 Plus Strong, grab your copy. Right now, my biggest thing is just continuing to rehab and work on getting back to normal. So... You know, you got to stay tuned because, you know, once I'm done with this, I have some things I'm working on. But I, I got to be completely healed first. I got to make sure it all worked the way it's supposed to work before yeah, I can yeah. you know, move to the next step in the process. <laughs> Absolutely. We'll be waiting uh, anxiously to see what's next for you. For anyone who's living in the Atlanta area, if you need a home, 
talk to our guy Cyrus Jones, Atlanta Luxury Real Estate. Numbers right there. Who better than Bama Sci-Fi to hook you up with a house? So give this man a call. He will definitely make sure you're taken care of. Also, former Alabama defensive lineman DJ Petway, his precision fencing business will get you in the right direction. Numbers right here. My, thank you so much. It was such a blessing for you to be with us. Um, thank not you. just to talk about Alabama football, but uh, I don't know if you remember this, but I, I met you back in 1999 in, in FCA, and um, you uh, were pouring life into me uh, through, through the message you're given that night. And then, you know, a couple of years later, when I graduated, you actually uh, helped me through a very difficult period of my life. And God used you in amazing ways. And uh, I've looked up to you ever since uh, because of what you did and what you allowed God to do, not only in my life, but in the lives of so many. So, you know, thank you for that. That, that really means so much. And for anyone who wants to follow you, if you would, let them know how they can contact you on social media, how they can get involved with your ministry and so on. They can go to castillefoundation.org or they can go to um, Instagram, Jeremiah Castillo 19. And um, I want to just real quick for Marv, I, you know, we I'm, I'm older, but I t- one of the reasons I had personally reached out to Marv and I've always respected his his body of work that he did at the University of Alabama as a player and um, the uh, intellectual side that he uh, he's a he's lived his life by. And I think all, you know, as a student athlete, that's very important. And so I was actually the reason I was trying to get Marvin to to be at our night of legends. I was going to let him just share, just uh, just share. So you get ready, have your speech ready for when we get ready to do uh, the the, the second uh, five uh, signing classes of uh, Coach Bryant. Oh, I am ready. You got to understand some growing up in Tuscaloosa, That's all you know is Alabama football. Mm-hmm. But to actually see the, the the evolution of it from, you know, where it started to where it is. I grew up selling coats and programs in Bryant Denny. So I got to see a lot of it firsthand, you know, and that's what motivated me more than anything else. Seeing people of my skin color doing this in this big stadium. I will not sell coats forever. I'm going to play in this stadium. And that's what I did. So I am more than ready. <laughs> Amen. We look forward to it, and uh, God bless to you all. Yes, sir. God bless you as well. Thank God you. God bless you. Roll Tide. Roll, Roll Tide. tide. <laughs>